Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm the co-chair of the SIR Communications Committee. Uh, and on behalf of the SIR RFS, I would like to welcome everyone to tonight's very informative webinar on the topic of endoscopy uh, in interventional radiology. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Jason Fisher, who is our Communications Committee member and organizer for this webinar. Jason, I'll go ahead and give it to you. Thanks, Justin, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, on behalf of our presenters and the RFS communications team and GI service line, I want to welcome you again to our webinar. Um, as Justin said, we're going to be discussing endoscopy and its use in IR procedures. Um, once again, my name is Jason Fisher, um, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of our presentation before we turn the floor over to our presenters. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing um, two of the biggest proponents in IR endoscopy that I see as someone at the beginning of their training, um, Dr. Jeffrey Chick from Innova Alexandria in DC and Dr. Ravi Srinivasa from the University of Michigan. Um, so before I hand over the floor, just another reminder that tonight's session will be recorded and uploaded to the IR Education YouTube channel in case you miss anything. And also, if you have any questions, We'll try and address them at the end, and on your control panel on the right side of your screen, you'll see a box for entering those questions. I'll be keeping track so we can summarize them and, and cover the most pertinent ones towards the end. Uh, so with that, let's begin. Dr. Chick, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for coming, everyone, today. Uh, so Ravi and I, I think, are very excited to talk about this topic. Uh, we're certainly big proponents of endoscopy and uh, its use throughout interventional radiology. I don't think it's uh, really used in too many institutions, but our hope is that uh, with some time this will be used or implemented at a lot of places. Uh, so we, I think we both urge everyone to ask any kind of questions you have, anything at all. Uh, you can interrupt us, you can ask them at the end, and I think we're totally fine with that. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the general overview of endoscopy, uh, some of the equipment, some of the uses, and show some cases. Some of them are uh, some things that Ravi and I have done that are a little bit more obscure. And then afterwards, Ravi's going to talk a little bit about, uh, I think, the more common practice, which is biliary endoscopy and what most of us are familiar with. Uh, so with that, we'll get started. So obviously a lot of people to thank just to begin with. Uh, I mean, I have to thank Ravi incredibly because he taught me a lot of this. And uh, I think both of us learned a lot of this at University of Pennsylvania, but uh, Ravi at least taught me a lot of the advanced techniques. And then uh, all the cases that we'll show, uh, a bunch of our fellows from University of Michigan were involved in. So uh, at least my goals tonight are to talk a little bit about the indications for endoscopy, uh, talk a little bit about how we select patients, uh, show some of the various different equipment that can be you borrowed or purchased, show some of our general steps for how we do interventional endoscopy, talk a little bit about how to take care of our patients afterwards, and then I'll show some of our cases. Uh, so classically, I think uh, when we think of endoscopy, we think of uh, procedures that are done by the gastroenterologist or by urologists. Um, but actually, interventional radiologists have been using endoscopy for quite a while. Uh, actually, biliary endoscopy and uh, cholecystoscopy, uh, looking in the biliary tree or looking in the gallbladder, has actually been done for several years. If you look throughout the literature, there are many studies from the University of Pennsylvania, from Mallinckrodt, from Johns Hopkins, and from Michigan as well, showing uh, the use of endoscopy in interventional radiology. But uh, what Ravi and I think have pushed for uh, over the past couple of years is uh, some additional uses of endoscopy outside the standard uh, biliary endoscopy. So uh, we're interested in genital urinary endoscopy, uh, for instance, removing foreign bodies or removing uh, kidney stones uh, or using endoscopy to help place uh, nephrostomy tubes or nephroureteral stents. Uh, we're also interested in endoscopy of the gastrointestinal tract in patients who have altered anatomy or in which uh, gastroenterology typically fails in their procedures, sort of some unusual procedures such as transgastric endoscopy, duodenoscopy, rectal endoscopy, 
uh, colonic endoscopy and so forth. And then also a variety of other miscellaneous uses, usages such as uh, laser fistula ablation with, endos with endoscopic monitoring and so forth. So we'll get into some of these a little bit later. So obviously this all begins or should begin, I think with a multidisciplinary uh, discussion. I think in general, this is likely to fail uh, or meet a lot of resistance if interventional radiologists uh, purchase all this equipment and go headstrong and uh, basically try to bypass gastroenterologists or bypass uh, urologists. It's more of a complementary modality uh, in patients who are either uh, too ill to have other procedures or who have uh, altered anatomy or have, ha or have had uh, failed procedures in the past. A lot of the patients that Ravi and I have done things on uh, are patients that have multiple medical comorbidities. For instance, uh, we've been particularly interested in removing gallstones from patients uh, who could not have cholecystectomies uh, due to multiple medical comorbidities, whether cardiac or pulmonary or so forth. So good multidisciplinary discussion is a good place to start. And then identifying patients who have altered anatomy or multiple medical problems are those patients that interventionalists can ultimately help. As with uh, all procedures, uh, obtaining laboratory values before you begin any of these procedures is very helpful having an INR and platelets, uh, typically an INR of one, around 1 1.5 and platelets around uh, 50,000 is helpful, but not completely obligatory. Uh, but as with any procedure, it's helpful to be safe. So there is a whole host or a variety of equipment that can be purchased uh, or actually just borrowed from uh, many of the urologists or many of the operating rooms in the hospital to do endoscopy. So there are a variety of flexible scopes and there is one standard rigid endoscope <clears throat> and there are a variety of reusable and there are a variety of disposable scopes. Uh, so the scopes come as small as 7.9 French and as large as 22.5 French. So a uh, couple things to, uh, to highlight here, uh, particularly one of the workhorse scopes is the 16.5 uh, French flexible scope. It's a reusable scope that can be, uh, that many of the urologists use for urologic procedures. It can be sterilized and reused, and it's, uh, it can allow you to do biliary endoscopy, uh, gastric endoscopy, uh, genital urinary nephroscopy, uh, endoscopy, and all sorts of procedures. Um, and this is sort of in contrast to the other workhorse, which is the 22.5 French rigid uh, endoscope, which is also reusable. And uh, this is a large caliber scope, uh, which again, uh, the urologists use to remove stones and is particularly useful for removing gallstones uh, in the gallbladder. Now, something new to the market, uh, which Ravi kind of has pioneered the use of a little bit, is this uh, 9.5 French uh, disposable endoscope, which is called the LithoView endoscope. And something that's nice about this is it can be purchased uh, with a monitor and can uh, just come as a box set uh, from Boston Scientific. So if your institution doesn't have any of these devices or they're difficult to get, uh, this disposable endoscope can be purchased uh, as a unit for about $1,500 and it can be used uh, for a variety of cases. It's a single use scope. Uh, there are also other scopes, uh, 7.9 French and a 9 French. Uh, by various companies. And in addition, there are probably other ones out there as well. Uh, but the ones that we ha have used are made by Boston Scientific or Olympus. And to be honest, they're great. So with those scopes uh, come a variety of ancillary devices that can be used uh, for a host of things. Uh, baskets, uh, such as uh, basically any sort of night and all basket. Uh, a Wittich basket or anything can be used to remove foreign bodies or to remove stones uh, throughout any uh, system of the body, whether it's the GI tract, whether it's the biliary system or whether it's the genital urinary system. Uh, a couple other devices that are particularly useful for breaking up stones, whether they be uh, stones throughout the biliary tree, gallbladder or uh, kidneys 
are the lithotripters, which uh, come in two forms, the electrohydraulic and the ultrasonic. Uh, these break up stones. Uh, something we have been using a little bit more is the holmium laser, which is essentially a laser fiber, which also is good for breaking up uh, either biliary stones or gallstones as well. And then other things can be used, uh, just balloons to macerate and push things throughout uh, these various systems or thrombectomy devices, which are essentially like a little motorized blender, which also can push things. So this is sort of the standard equipment that we've been using. Uh, most of these things come with uh, towers, which can be obtained from uh, the operating rooms, from our urologic colleagues, or from our gastroenterology colleagues. Uh, so in general, uh, the towers look like these here. Uh, they have a large monitor. Uh, they have monitors that are not high definition and monitors that are high def definition as well. Uh, they have a whole host of video processing systems on these carts, uh, which can, if you're lucky, uh, save the images either to a flash drive or other devices, or probably can be uploaded to the medical record as well. And uh, also they have the power generators uh, for the cameras and the light sources for the endoscopes and also the generators for the lithotriptor devices for breaking up the stones. So just to show a few examples of the scopes so you know what they look like. Uh, so this is the 7.9 French flexible scope. Uh, again, this is a scope that uh, some of the urologists use. It is a reusable scope, which means after you, re after you use it, it can just be sterilized and uh, basically autoclaved and then reused next time. So most of the scopes have the same uh, sort of uh, setup. Uh, there's a, uh, an end uh, where the camera attaches and allows uh, a connection to the screen. Uh, there's an area where the light cable attaches uh, to provide light to the scope itself. Uh, and then there's a channel uh, where you can uh, supply fluid uh, so that there's continuous irrigation. You can see throughout the entire procedure and you can put a variety of devices through it. Uh, again, such as thrombectomy devices, baskets, or lasers. So similar, uh, this is the LithoView disposable endoscope that I talked about a little bit. Uh, so this is the scope that uh, is totally uh, disposable. It's a single use scope that costs about $1,500. So if your institution doesn't have endoscopes at all, uh, this one can easily be obtained. Uh, again, it's by Boston Scientific. Uh, it comes with this uh, handy monitor, uh, which is shown here on the right. Uh, essentially, this thing is uh, you just plug in and go. Uh, it's a great scope for just about doing anything. And this as well can uh, handle the homium laser. It can handle a bunch of baskets as well uh, for either uh, shattering or removing stones uh, themselves. So this is what I talked a little bit about. Uh, this is sort of one of the workhorse scopes uh, the flex, the 16.5 French flexible reusable endoscope. Again, it's something that can be used once and then autoclaved and uh, used on the next patient. So again, it has a uh, area where the camera attaches, uh, an area where the light source attaches, and then a working channel uh, where again, fluid can be administered and a variety of devices can be uh, placed. So this is an example over here of what the camera cord itself looks like. One end attaches to the endoscope itself, and then the other end attaches uh, basically to your tower. And this is the light source. So all of these are powered by some sort of light, uh, which is which comes which is emitted from the tower itself. Uh, so one end attaches to the tower, and then the other end attaches to the endoscope. So this is uh, I said there are flexible scopes, and there are also rigid endoscopes. Uh, this rigid endoscope is a 22.5 scope. Uh, it's particularly useful, again, in the genital urinary tract and as well as in the gallbladder. Uh, this is the primary device that Robbie and I have used to remove gallstones and is particularly good for gallstones. Uh, Robbie will probably talk about it a little bit more later, um, but it has the rigid scope itself here. Uh, again, it has an end where uh, a 
light source attaches here, a camera attaches uh, down here, and then it has a variety of uh, working channels, which is through this outer sheath device here. You can get, you can apply fluid and you can uh, place your devices. And this is uh, particularly useful because through this large bore scope, you can put a variety of grasping devices that are much larger, such as these endobronchial forceps that are not easily accommodated uh, by the flexible scopes. So this is a great way. Not only can you see much better with these scopes, uh, but you can also grasp larger objects and you can place a variety of larger devices through the scopes. So here's just a couple of examples of things that can go through them. So this is uh, this end circle uh, grasping device or the red handled, gra red handled graspers uh, are essentially a basket device, uh, which is particularly good for grabbing onto small stones or foreign bodies wherever they are and removing them. It can be a tire, quite a tiring process, but uh, eventually by using this, you can remove all stones or foreign bodies. Uh, this is in contrast to the Holmium laser fiber, which you see here in the middle. Uh, which is a device uh, for actually fragmenting stones. Uh, again, anywhere in the body, in the biliary tree, in the gallbladder, in the kidneys, uh, anywhere. And this is just one of the lithotriptor devices down here. Uh, this is particularly useful for shattering or breaking stones, uh, either in the gallbladder or again, in the genital urinary system. So, how are most of these done? Uh, so typically, uh, depending upon where you're going to perform interventional endoscopy, uh, typically we give antibiotics, uh, which are in accordance with that system. Uh, for instance, if you're doing gastrointestinal endoscopy, give it antibiotics that cover gastroenterologic uh, microbes, or if you're going through the liver, uh, plan accordingly for the liver. Uh, historically at the University of Michigan, we had used general anesthesia for most of these patients uh, just because these can be long procedures. A lot of fluid is given during the procedures, which can cause electrolyte imbalances. Uh, patients can become hypothermic because of this fluid. Uh, but there are many other institutions who are not using general anesthesia. For instance, John Hopkins and Mellencrot historically had done these under moderate sedation uh, or maybe even less. Uh, so there's no right or wrong, uh, but I think general anesthesia helps uh, to just be safe and to do this expeditiously. So in most patients, uh, oral gastric tubes are placed and rectal tubes are placed as well. Uh, part of the reason is that a lot of fluid is instilled uh, through these endoscopes so that uh, various structures can be visualized. And with this, there's always a risk of aspiration and there's always a risk of causing electrolyte imbalances and hypothermia. So there needs to be some way uh, to remove the fluid so that it's not retained in the body. Uh, so that's why we place those tubes. A bear hugger is uh, almost always placed around patients. Uh, that's to help maintain a core body temperature uh, because again, with high volume uh, saline that's pumped through the scopes, uh, it can alter your core body temperature. So uh, with these scopes, we use uh, high pressurized three liter saline bags which force uh, saline through the scopes. Uh, most of that is so that uh, you can visualize the structures of interest. Uh, it clears debris. They can be used without uh, saline, but uh, the visual ability in the picture is much greater uh, if you actually use uh, pressurized saline. Uh, and another thing that is important is these cranial drapes. They're special drapes, which I'll show some pictures of, uh, which go on the patients. And uh, they essentially prevent the fluid from one, contacting the patient the entire time and lowering their body temperature and also uh, creating hazards in the IR suite in general because you have a lot of water flowing all over the place. It can get on the floor, it can get on the uh, interventional equipment. It can also get on the floor and uh, pose risk for slipping and so forth. So these drains help collect the water. There's pouches and bags that, so it doesn't get all over the place. And uh, the last thing is this drainage system, which is essentially a high, su high power suction device that's used in the operating room. And it uh, helps suck fluid out or helps uh, suck stones out uh, or so forth. So here's just a couple pictures of the various things. 
So these are the high pressure saline bags. Uh, essentially they're hung on IV poles. Uh, they've got these mesh bas these mesh bags around them to increase the pressure and they deliver through uh, normal venous tubing, uh, high pressured saline to the endoscopes themselves. So here's the cranial drapes that I talked a little bit about. So it's basically a plastic drape that goes around the patient. Uh, it's adherent to the patient uh, through some sticky material. And then it has a variety of pouches, which are then connected to uh, wall suction or suction devices uh, and these collection bags so that essentially the saline during the procedure does not uh, get all over the entire interventional suite. So here's how the reusable scopes typically come. Uh, they come in after they've been sterilized or autoclaved. They come up from the operating room or perhaps they're in your interventional suite. Uh, they come in a variety of boxes like this. Uh, they're all sterile. Uh, so on the left upper hand, uh, left upper picture, this is the camera again, which is all sterilized. This is the endoscope itself, uh, which I showed earlier. Uh, this is sort of the setup on your table. You have the endoscope, you have the light cable attached to the endoscope. Uh, you have the camera attached to the endoscope at the end here. And then you have the uh, working channel where the saline attaches and you can put a variety of devices. And in the final bottom image here, you see that working channel, you see the normal saline hooked up to the endoscope and you can see where you can place objects such as baskets or lasers or so forth through the scope. So after you set up the scope, after uh, your patient is anesthetized appropriately, you place your oral gastric tubes and you place your rectal tubes. So uh, most scopes uh, require that you do two things before you use it. Uh, the first thing is white balancing. Uh, this is just an option that's on the tower itself. And it's easiest to do this just by using a piece of white paper or a four by four gauze. Uh, you basically aim the scope at that and uh, it basically auto calibrates and white balances. And then uh, there's a variety of focusing mechanisms on the uh, endoscope camera itself. So after you white balance, then you focus the camera by getting obtaining something that has some sort of letters on it or some sort of uh, writing and just basically altering the configuration until it's sharp enough so that you can see everything. So you white balance and then uh, work on the focus and then you're nearly good to go. Um, so for the vast majority of these patients, um, historically, uh, interventional endoscopy had been used in patients who have had pre-existing uh, drainage catheters or tubes. So these are patients that had previously had biliary drains in place. Uh, then they came back four or six weeks later and we performed uh, transhepatic endoscopy. Or these are patients that had cholecystostomies in place and then four to six weeks later we performed uh, or cholecystoscopy here. Um, and similar for the GI tract, uh, gastrostomy tube was already in place and then these patients came back and uh, had evaluation. Uh, but now Ravi and I have been finding that a lot of these procedures can actually be performed in a single session. Uh, they, patients often do not need to have a pre-existing tube or tract. Uh, we can do endoscopy on the first uh, try here. So if we get access to the gallbladder with a needle, place a wire, then we can just dilate the tract up instantly and uh, visualize with the endoscope. Similarly for the gastrointestinal tract, uh, we can basically place primary gastrostomy tubes and in the process uh, use the endoscope to evaluate the gastrointestinal tract at that time. But all in all, no matter what, uh, what we need to do is uh, no matter what your access, whether the biliary tree, the gallbladder, the stomach, uh, wherever, the kidney, uh, first uh, you have to have a tract to the organ. Uh, so you have your needle and then you have wire in there and then over that track, you need to dilate it. Uh, so if you're using one of the flexible scopes, typically you can use a peel-away sheath. Uh, we usually use a peel-away sheath that's two French larger than the endoscope itself. Uh, and then through that peel-away sheath, uh, we place two safety wires, and then uh, you can use the flexible endoscope through that peel-away sheath. If you're using the rigid endoscope, 
since it's larger, 22.4 French, uh, you need a larger sheath to put that through. Uh, so there's this balloon called the Bard X-Force balloon, which again is a urology balloon, uh, and it comes with this plastic cannula. Uh, so you use this balloon to dilate the tract, and then you place this plastic cannula, and then through the cannula, you can place the endoscope. So here are some of the uh, just images. Again, uh, on the left is the, an image of the flexible endoscope uh, through the peel away sheath uh, here. And then on the right, you have the rigid endoscope. You have one of the lithotriptor devices there for breaking up stones. And you can see the plastic cannula there from the Bard X-Force balloon. So here's just a couple examples again of our various scopes. So an A is the disposable endoscope. That's a lithoview scope that can be purchased and is a single use scope, costs about $1,500. In B, uh, that's our working horse 16.5 French scope, uh, which can be sterilized and reused and can be used in almost any system, the biliary tree, the gallbladder, uh, the gastrointestinal system or the general urinary system. Uh, C is just showing our, our sort of standard setup, the uh, regular arrow is where the camera attaches, the dash arrow is the light source, and then the uh, just the arrow head is where the saline and the working channel attach. D is an example of the uh, setup for our rigid endoscope, and then the final image there is just uh, the reusable endoscope being used with one of our uh, baskets there. So. After our procedures, uh, typically uh, what we do is we place some sort of drainage catheter uh, after you do whatever you're doing, uh, whether it's removing stones, whether it's removing foreign bodies, whether it's just visualizing the structures, whether it's helping you uh, use it to place uh, some sort of difficult to place tube. Uh, afterwards, we place some sort of drainage catheter for a variety of period of time. So if it's in the biliary tree, uh, typically we just place a biliary drainage catheter, either an eight or a 10 French drainage, uh, transhepatic biliary drain. If it's in the gallbladder, uh, typically we place a 14 French uh, cholecystostomy tube, as well as an 8.5 French transcystic drainage catheter uh, was our preference at the University of Michigan. However, not all institutions do that. Uh, if it's uh, in the gastrointestinal system, in the stomach, you place your standard 18 French gastrostomy. Uh, in, the, in the kidneys, you can place either an 8 or a 10 French uh, nephrostomy tube or a nephroureteral stent. Uh, and then these patients come back shortly after that, uh, somewhere between two and six weeks. Uh, the tubes can be checked to see if uh, you accomplished your goal, such as removing the stones, uh, and then they can be removed appropriately. So I'll just show a couple examples of some of the uh, standard things that Ravi and I have done, as well as some more uh, non-traditional things. Uh, and this hopefully will illustrate sort of the future of where this is going. So this is uh, sort of the hallmark of what most people had done with interventional endoscopy. Uh, so this is a patient who had multiple gallstones. Uh, you can see in A, it's a gallbladder with multiple filling defects and a cholecystostomy tube in place. Uh, this patient was a poor surgical candidate uh, who could not have a cholecystectomy. Uh, so basically, they were relegated to a uh, tube for life. Um, and uh, one of our colleagues uh, recently, Jake Bundy, uh, sort of analyzed all these patients and uh, had shown that through a little bit of uh, effort with using these procedures, we were able to get the uh, cholecystostomy tubes out of all of these patients or out of many of these patients. So in B, you can see an image of the Bard X-Force balloon, which is basically your access to the gallbladder so that you can place the endoscope. Uh, in C, you can see uh, the sheath, the, the arrow, the regular arrow is pointing to the plastic sheath. And then the dash arrow is the lithotriptor device through the endoscope itself. So typically your pictures look a little bit like D. Uh, so they're actually very high definition, uh, depending on how close uh, or far you are from the object and how well you're focused. Uh, you can actually see the stones quite well. And under direct visualization, you're able to remove all the stones as you see in E, where essentially this would be impossible uh, without 
uh, direct visualization. So you can certainly see with fluoroscopy alone, you can see many, many stones, but there's no way on earth that you'd be able to actually remove all of these stones without direct visualization. So it's a great adjunct uh, for our standard fluoroscopy and ultrasound guidance. Uh, and it's very, very helpful. And then, as I said afterwards, uh, particularly for our gallbladder interventions, we placed a 14 French uh, cholecystostomy tube, which is shown by the arrow, and an 8.5 French transcystic drain uh, through the cystic duct, uh, just so that it remains patent. And then we bring the patients back, usually at two weeks, the uh, transcystic drain is removed, and then another two weeks after that, the cholecystostomy may be removed. So here's another example. I think this is the next one. Yeah. So this is a little bit of a more unusual case. Uh, so this is a case that Ravi and I did. Uh, it's a patient that came in with multiple intrahepatic masses. Uh, you can see an A uh, dilated biliary, uh, dilation of the biliary tree, which is shown by the arrowhead, and then these soft tissue filling defects uh, that are throughout the biliary tree. So this is a patient that uh, had an elevated bilirubin, had signs of cholangitis, and essentially uh, many people at outside hospitals had tried to place biliary drainage catheters but were unsuccessful. Uh, so we gave it our try, and uh, we thought that endoscopy would be helpful in actually placing, in one, determining what exactly was going on, and two, in placing our biliary drainage catheters. So in B, you can see the flexible endoscope from a transhepatic approach. Uh, which ultimately did help us place uh, in the internal external biliary drain, which you can see by the wires in the from the dashed arrow there. And uh, in C, you can see what we actually saw when we looked with the endoscope. And this turned out to be an introductal neoplasm, um, essentially something that's found in the pancreas or the biliary tree as well. Basically, this frond-like tissue, uh, these floating from like balls throughout the entire biliary tree. So we ended up using this cautery device, this bug bee cautery device, uh, which you can actually see in B by the arrowhead, and basically fulgurating or burning this tumor away and uh, removing the sample. Um, so we're able to come up with a pathologic diagnosis using endoscopy here, uh, and we're actually actually ultimately able to place the internal external biliary drains when this wasn't exactly possible any other way. Uh, this is another biliary case. Uh, it was a case of a planned biliary drainage. Uh, so in A, you can see a dilated biliary tree. You can see an abrupt cutoff in the common bile duct from some uh, neoplasm. So the request was for biliary drainage. Uh, so during our standard attempt to uh, perform biliary drainage, one of the uh, pieces of equipment, the AccuStick device, or the device that helps place a drainage catheter actually fractured. So they're very difficult to see actually on fluoroscopy alone because they're radiolucent. Uh, so ultimately endoscopy was here was used to for foreign body retrieval. So in B, you can see the flexible endoscope. Uh, C is what the biliary tree looks like under endoscopy on its own. Uh, that's a normal biliary tree. And then uh, D, you can see with that disposable monitor, that's the LithoView monitor, you can see the actual uh, part of the actual wire there and part of the actual broken AccuStick. And to be honest, without the uh, visual, the direct visualization, it'd be incredibly difficult to remove this fragment. And it's important to remove this because this is a nidus. In many cases, it may be, the patients may be asymptomatic, but it also is potentially a nidus for uh, future infection. So in E, you can see with the endoscope, a snare was able was a snare was used to actually retrieve the fragment, and then its corresponding uh, component on the AccuStick. So that's a little bit of the standard uses. But uh, Ravi and I have been trying to uh, push the envelope yeah, a little bit. Uh, yeah. I'm going to stop real quick because uh, I think someone asked a case specific question regarding the gallstone case, and yeah. they're wondering how long a typical case like that would last. Uh, so it's it's variable. I mean, it depends a little bit on the number of stones. Uh, so they can be fairly quick, uh, say an hour or two, or uh, we, Ravi and I had a case that's actually, uh, if you check out our JVIR video, which shows how to do this, 
uh, we had a patient who probably had over a hundred stones and it took us uh, most of the morning into the afternoon to remove them all. So the standard case, just remove one or two large stones can take an hour or so, two hours, or it can take four to six hours to painstakingly remove each and every stone here. So we've sort of been pushing the envelope a little bit. And uh, these are the next two cases are two interesting cases that Ravi and I did, uh, which are a little bit rare, but uh, highlight the use of endoscopy. Uh, so this is a patient who actually had coil embolization of a renal pseudoaneurysm for uh, bleeding. And then several years later, the patient presented with hematuria and uh, on the actual CT exams, it showed that the embolization coils had eroded from the renal artery into the renal collecting system. So A, B, C, D, you can see that the actual coils are have protruded from the renal artery into the collecting system. And as a result, they were causing obstruction and they were causing uh, the patient to become infected. But there is really no good way to remove these. Uh, to be honest, the urologists are very good with their scopes, but they're good for lasering and removing stones, but they don't have a great way for removing foreign bodies. Plus, uh, if during foreign body retrieval, there was an injury or uh, there was substantial bleeding, there's no great way to stop it. So uh, we were kind of in the best position to really do everything. Uh, so what we did was actually get arterial access, as you can see in D and E, uh, just in case there was uh, bleeding during the procedures, we would be able to embolize either with coils or glue or so forth and stop the bleeding. Then we got access to the kidney, uh, like placing a normal nephrostomy with a needle and a wire. And then using, um, we placed a rigid endoscope and through the rigid endoscope, you can actually see, which is pretty impressive in H, the embolization coils, which are actually uh, protruding from the renal artery into the collecting system. And the images are just incredible and actually beautiful. Uh, and then using the endobronchial forceps, we remove them one by one uh, from this patient. And afterwards, we did a renal arteriogram, which you can see in J. We saw no evidence of bleeding, but all the coils were removed. And uh, in K, you can just see good flow throughout that kidney afterwards. It's surprising, but there's actually almost the exact same case that we had. Uh, we've written up both of these now uh, in endourology. But this is sort of the same patient uh, who, again, had renal embolization and had coils that eroded from their renal artery into the collecting system several months later. And again, we did more or less the same thing uh, where we had uh, arterial access just in case there was bleeding. So in C and D, you can see that. In D, we had an occlusion balloon blown up uh, just in case we needed to embolize something. And again, in E and G, uh, you can see what uh, those coils look like under direct visualization eroding into the collecting system. This was the same case where we used the rigid endoscope to remove them in a piecemeal fashion. However, this time, unlike the first case, this patient actually did bleed, which you can see in A, uh, you, or in H, you can see the injury and the contrast extravasation from one of the lower pole renal arteries. So ultimately what we did is we, uh, with using that occlusion balloon, we were able to stop the bleeding and then we glue embolized uh, that bleed. The patient did really well. Uh, we placed an nephroureteral stent afterwards and this patient's infection resolved as well. So some of the crazy things, again, uh, we've been pushing the envelope for are its use, uh, biliary or endoscopy's use in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, so we've used it to remove a variety of foreign bodies to help place uh, difficult GJ tubes uh, or remove stents or remove fractured enteric tubes. But this was a particularly interesting case. Again, this is a patient that had a similar, similar story, uh, had a left renal artery embolization, or a, uh, sorry, left gastric artery embolization. The coils actually eroded from the uh, left gastric artery into the stomach or into the esophagus as well through an ulcer cavity. And this patient was having hematemesis. Uh, in upper EGD, on upper EGD, the uh, gastroenterologist saw the coils, but again, didn't really know what to do with them. Uh, so they called us for help. Uh, so what we did is we got transgastric access, like placing a G-tube uh, into the stomach. Uh, and then from that approach, we 
we placed the rigid endoscope, which you can see in A, and through, we put a coda balloon actually in the esophagus, which is a very large balloon, and that was to prevent aspiration from all the fluid that went into the stomach. And then you can see the actual coils themselves ro eroding through the ulcer here. And using the forceps again, we were able to remove these, and uh, the hematemesis resolved in this patient, and they did very well. Uh, we've also used this uh, not only for upper endoscopy, but for lower endoscopy uh, in patients that have had biliary or that have gastrointestinal or colonic strictures from a variety of malignancies. Uh, we've helped uh, a lot of times uh, gastroenterologists uh, are unable to get through difficult strictures. Uh, but with our ability to use wires and catheters to navigate past strictures, we can use these tools together uh, to actually be successful. So this is a patient that had a colonic malignancy, had a rectal or low sigmoid stricture, uh, which you can see by the arrows in A. So initially we were able to place a wire, a glide wire, a glide catheter through this region, and then visualize the actual stricture and visualize uh, what part of the colon is actually diseased. And using that, we were able to reconstruct the entire colon using a variety of stents. And again, I mean, some of this is a little bit short term. It certainly doesn't fix the fact that they may have colorectal cancer or other malignancy, but it can be used in a palliative fashion and actually change uh, the quality of life substantially. And this is just one final thing that uh, Robbie and I have been doing, which is a little bit unusual, but uh, patients who have chronic uh, uh, fistulas from uh, gastrocutaneous or enterocutaneous, essentially patients who have a fistula from the bowel to the skin and are leaking material. These things are incredibly difficult to close. Uh, they leak and leak and leak. They don't heal well because uh, they have multiple medical comorbidities. They have poor nourishment. Uh, they're malnourished. Uh, so these are tracts that essentially leak stool to the skin. Uh, we have a few treatments for them, such as uh, fibrin glue or NBCA glue, but to be honest, nothing works very well. Uh, so Ravi came up with this technique of uh, laser ablating or using the laser that we use in the veins to close these tracks. And uh, this is just sort of an interesting case of a patient who had a, a gastrocutaneous fistula. Uh, they had an actual fistula uh, and we were closing it with the laser and at the same time, we just watch the process with the endoscope uh, to see it actually working. So in C, you can see this fistulous communication from the stomach to the skin, and you can see the laser fiber there. And then in D, you can actually see when the laser fiber is used, it actually burns and closes the tract itself. So it works, and there's direct proof of it working, and it's just fascinating to watch it uh, using endoscopy. So that's a little bit of what we talked about. I talked tried to talk a little bit about the indications, what sort of patients we do this in, showed some of our equipment and uh, some of our post-procedural care. I will say that uh, Ravi and I made a how to do how to do it video, which this is an image from. Uh, it's for removal of gallstones uh, from the gallbladder, uh, and it's on JV, the JVIR website and on uh, JVIR as well. Uh, and it's sort of a great tutorial that shows some of the things we talked, I at least talked about tonight, and some of the things Ravi will talk about next. Uh, and it's a great way just to see everything and sort of reinforce this and uh, just remind you of how to do all of this. So some of these PowerPoints will certainly be available, which has uh, some of the references for all of this and uh, where you can find additional information. Uh, there aren't too many publications out there, but Ravi and I have been trying to uh, produce some of this material or make a lot more of this material available for everyone. Uh, and both of us are very happy to take emails uh, or texts or phone calls anytime from any of you with any kind of questions, no matter what. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Ravi. Wow, awesome presentation, Dr. Chick. Thank you so much. Um, we do have one question lingering. Um, yeah. Why did you prefer a transgastric approach instead of a transoral approach for the coil erosion case in the stomach, uh, especially when the gastroenterologist had already seen it? Well, so I think part of it is uh, we're a little more comfortable, one, with transgastric access. I mean, we 
place G tubes all the time. Uh, it's an easy way for us to have direct access to the stomach. Then another thought is a lot of our patients, like I said, they we do these under general anesthesia, they're intubated. So it's not super easy uh, to go down the mouth and uh, to fit the scope. Uh, the other issue is uh, in order to see very well and to use the equipment, we need the rigid endoscope. And the rigid endoscope is something that's not flexible. It's very short in nature and it can't go down the nose or the mouth uh, at all. So essentially the transgastric approach is really the only approach uh, that could really be utilized for that case. Okay, great. No other questions from the audience right now. Um, if anyone listening in does have questions, keep entering them, and we'll make sure we get to them at the end of the next part of the presentation, if not sooner. Um, so to keep us moving along, I'll switch us over to Dr. Srinivasa, who's going to take us through uh, his take on a lot of the same. Great. Uh, perfect. Thanks, Justin and Jason, for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to talk to everyone here today. Uh, and thanks, Jeff. That was an awesome overview of uh, interventional endoscopy, and I'm glad we're spreading the word more. Um, as you guys both, as you guys probably know, uh, Jeff and I worked at the University of Michigan up until uh, together up until about a month ago, uh, and we're now headed to opposite coast. Jeff's already headed over to the East Coast, and I'll be heading over to the West Coast here soon in a few months. Um, so it's nice that we can still keep in touch academically for, for uh, these types of talks and uh, especially with endoscopy because it's something we're really passionate about and uh, I think Jeff would agree as well that these are some of the most fun procedures that we do um, as interventionalists fusing endoscopy and, uh, and IR has just uh, been remarkable and uh, amazing to kind of experience kind of uh, from the ground up. Um, so I'd, again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Jeff, uh, as well as um, Anthony Hage, one of our medical students who's helped us with many of these talks, uh, and then Dr. DeSica, who had pioneered many of these endoscopy techniques as well prior to my uh, joining uh, University of Michigan. Um, both Jeff and I also trained at University of Pennsylvania, and we kind of got a lot of this inspiration also from uh, our division chief at Penn, um, uh, Scott Teratola. So it was nice that we had that connection as well. and had some inspiration uh, early on as well. So um, so I'm just gonna talk about biliary endoscopy today to kind of give you an overview. Uh, Jeff kind of covered some of the aspects of biliary endoscopy as well, um, but I'll go into a little bit more detail about specifically cholidocoscopy and cholecystoscopy um, as we talk through this lecture. And feel free to again interrupt if you have any questions as we move along. Um, so the big thing we've been trying to kind of uh, uh, tout is that Endoscopy is easy. It's as an interventional radiologist, we're used to using catheters and wires. You adding an endoscope to the tools and to your armamentarium of uh, uh, tools that you have in 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 the um, in the workshop is is pretty simple and it's very intuitive, very easy to use. We've showed this to medical students, from medical students to fellows. Everyone within 15 minutes or so of handling an endoscope kind of gets the feel for it. And within an hour, you're almost proficient at using the endoscope. So um, some of the things we've started to develop are these training phantoms to kind of help teach, uh, uh, you know, medical students and residents uh, on how to use these uh, scopes prior to using it on actual patients. We've generated these video tutorials, which Jeff alluded to. Um, the workshop that we did at SAR this year, we've been trying to publish things to, to get the word out a little bit more. Obviously, uh, the acquisition costs of getting endoscopes are very expensive to get endoscopy towers. You can borrow them from the ORs, from the GI suite, but uh, it's sometimes a little bit cumbersome. You don't want to step on toes, and so you get a little bit antsy about reaching out to other departments. But at the same time, they, if, you, if you bring it on as kind of a collaborative effort to try to do better care for patients, uh, I think you'll get a lot of reception uh, depending on where you, when you, where you are. Um, the one thing that Jeff alluded to as well earlier is the disposable endoscopes, which are really low cost. I was just talking coincidentally to my brother uh, today, he's one of our IR fellows, about uh, how he could start an endoscopy practice when he's, uh, when he's joining his group down in Austin. Um, and the easiest way to, uh, to do that is to, it's to actually get these disposable endoscopes because it's so easy to set up, it's low cost, it's $1,500 to pop. Um, you can easily get them, you need very little material. And if you want more details on how you could acquire those types of scopes, 
that's truly the easiest way you can start doing endoscopy. It's a flexible endoscope. You can do most things with it. So it's a good way to get your, uh, get your feet wet and get things going. Um, the billing and coding of these procedures, we kind of emulate the GI codes and the urology codes, and we're happy to provide details on those as well as, as needed. Um, we created some of these phantoms uh, that we 3D printed with Dr. Wedek, who's here at the University of Michigan, um, and we kind of made some stuff out of Home Depot supplies, and that, you know, it's just a kind of a cheap way to make uh, make a model so that you can practice doing endoscopy. So our goal is to go from this or, uh, to this with the gallbladder with cholecystoscopy, go from a gallbladder with the stone in it to this is a simple case where there was just a single gallstone uh, to taking the gallstone out. Uh, and the only way to really do that easily is to do it with direct visualization. Again, as Jeff alluded to earlier, it's very, very hard to try to capture something that's mobile within a structure without directly seeing it. So um, again, so typically this is performed as a multi-stage procedure. However, uh, lately, as Jeff alluded to also, uh, we've started to do this in a single stage procedure as well, where you do access and then uh, upsize and, and put an endoscope in. It's minimally invasive, it avoids high risk surgery, um, and surgeons love it because uh, we, we can provide an easy out for them when they don't want to operate. Um, also, GI loves it because in certain instances where they can't get to where uh, they need to get using ERCP, we can get there percutaneously very easily. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more details about that here in a few slides. Um, and the goal here is to get patients tube free. And we've always talked and touted also on Twitter about this live tube free concept of uh, patients don't want to have a tube for the rest of their life. If they're 80 years old, they still don't, probably don't, they especially don't want to have a tube for the rest of their life. So it's nice that we can do an endoscopic procedure that's minimally invasive. You can do it under sedation. Uh, that's It's much safer for these patients with multiple comorbidities or you know older patients who have potentially additional risk uh, and successfully remove uh, their tubes. So uh, the scope of application, again, we do this for a variety of different uh, reasons. You can do it for biopsy of structures under direct visualization, you can remove foreign bodies. Um, just the other day, we removed a pancreatic duct stent that uh, had migrated into the biliary tree under direct visualization that we weren't able to remove uh, using standard snares and standard uh, fluoroscopic approaches. We were able to directly see it, grab it with, a, uh, uh, by, with forceps essentially, and pull it out successfully. Um, you can remove uh, other structure or other foreign bodies that have migrated into the biliary tree so this is in addition to doing stones. Um, you can also treat chronic strictures. We've started to experiment with different techniques for kind of ablating strictures to treat benign biliary strictures. So there's so many applications for, for endoscopy that we probably haven't even all thought of. So, um, so there's a lot of things you can do with this. Um, so the variety of indications include also the basic ones like cholelithiasis for gallstones, cholelithiasis, biliary casts, which happen in liver transplant patients who have hepatic artery stenosis and develop these casts, which can be really cumbersome to remove, but can really, really help patients and let their liver transplant last a lot longer if you actually do cholelithoscopy, take out these casts and remove them and, and uh, unobstruct their biliary tree. Um, so we talked about biliary strictures briefly, biliary masses, which Jeff showed a case of. Um, so the real patients where these are, um, options where it's a good option to consider doing percutaneous endoscopy are patients who aren't good surgical candidates who can't undergo ERCP. Again, we don't, we're not saying that this should replace ERCP. ERCP should be first line if it's an option. If the patient has conventional anatomy, they're young, they're, there's no reason they can't undergo ERCP, they should go get an ERCP first. You're not making a percutaneous hole and it's, you're going transorally. It's definitely the first line approach. It's when they have fail the ERCP, they're due to a duodenal diverticulum, they have Ruin Y gastric bypass anatomy where they need to do a double balloon enteroscopy, or you know, where they have altered gastric anatomy where it'd be very difficult for the endoscopist or the GI endoscopist to do um, ERCP where we come in and we can be really helpful to them. Um, and uh, those are the cases where it's extraordinarily helpful. The other cases are like where you have recurrent pyogenic cholangitis, where you have numerous stones extending within the biliary tree. It's really cumbersome for them to try to do that uh, using ERCP, and it's probably better treated by percutaneous techniques and percutaneous endoscopy. Um, so there are some contraindications to doing endoscopy, one being the usual, the uncorrectable uh, coagulopathy. Um, 
you know, if you can get them corrected, though, you should be able to do endoscop endoscopy safely. Um, if a patient has an active infection, so such as active cholangitis, you definitely want to place a biliary drain, let them cool down, give them antibiotics, and then bring them back for col uh, cholidocoscopy in the future. Same thing with the gallbladder. You don't want to do a single session cholecystoscopy if the patient's actively infected, if there's pus coming out of the gallbladder, if there's um, stones, they're presenting with acute cholecystitis, definitely uh, the best option is to put in, a, if, if they're not a surgical candidate to get a cholecystectomy, then place a percutaneous cholecystostomy, let them cool off for six weeks, give them antibiotics, let them drain, and then bring them back for potential removal of the stones and upsize of the tube and subsequent removal of the stones in the future. So those are the best options. Um, so with regards to uh, patient prep, so we've been doing most of these procedures under general endotracheal anesthesia. Again, you can do them with uh, moderate sedation as well. Um, again, supine access with access into the right upper quadrant uh, using um, using your standard percutaneous techniques for getting either biliary access or getting gallbladder access with ultrasound. Um, we uh, give patients prophylactic antibiotics with ceftriaxone and gentamicin prior to all of these procedures. Um, again, as Jeff said before, we, we use uh, 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 high volumes of saline, so it can cause electrolyte imbalances, so you got to make sure you let anesthesia know about these things ahead of time. Um, the other things are these orogastric and rectal tubes, and I know a lot of places don't uh, use orogastric and rectal tubes. I, I would, you know, with regards to that specifically, the it's, it's okay not to use orogastric tubes in, when you're doing cholidocoscopy with smaller scopes, such as the nine and a half French scopes or the 7.95 French scopes, which are the typical scopes that people are using. But when you get to these larger scopes, such as the 16 and a half French scope, which we typically use for biliary casts, because biliary casts can be tremendously difficult to do with just a smaller scope. Uh, with the 16 and a half French flexible scope, it's made a lot easier. Um, in those scopes and with the rigid scope, which we use for cholecystoscopy, I strongly urge you to use orogastric tubes only because it, it you can easily cause the patient to aspirate. Uh, we, we had a case the other day, that same pancreatic duct stent, where I'm glad we had an orogastric tube because about 100 cc's of fluid was sucked out and there was even a little bit of fluid in the esophagus which had to be sucked out. And, and you know, they they're, in this case, they were protected also with an endotracheal tube, but if you, again, you're doing these under sedation, you definitely need some additional suction. It could be a nasogastric tube if you're doing it with sedation so that you can just at least remove some of this excess fluid. Typically, if you're using the larger scopes, though, you should probably do the procedure under general anesthesia. The smaller scopes, though, can be used for most procedures. So again, that, that uh, disposable scope, the biliary uh, or the lithoview scope uh, is actually nine and a half French, and that can be done probably with moderate sedation safely. Um, we use bear huggers, as, as we said earlier, as well, to keep the uh, body temperature uh, normal as well. So we, Jeff kind of already talked about how we use water-based scopes with these three-liter saline bags, and uh, he showed this as well, where we use these adherent cranial drapes. And again, I'll reiterate that these are important because you don't want water to get on the patient's skin. Again, that'll cool the patient down, and you don't want to make them hypothermic. You have them on the bear hugger as well, but this keeps everything watertight and also prevents your room from turning into a huge mess. Um, these are the scopes again, which uh, Jeff talked about as well, which has all the hookups, which he already explained. Um, here's a setting up an endoscope. We used to record these cases with the GoPro camera just to kind of show, uh, show off the techniques and whatnot for how we do these endoscopic uh, procedures. Um, the um, uh, the uh, first setup stuff is to do the white balance and then set the focus, et cetera and uh, all that works relatively easily, uh, which uh, Jeff already talked about as well. The uh, ports for saline irrigation and lighting uh, and whatnot are, are he already talked about as well. The uh, uh, other thing, so with, uh, for, the, uh, for endoscopy that we use are, are these nine and a half, nine, nine French scopes, the 7.95 French scope, um, and uh, the 16 and a half French scope. Hang on one second, sorry, I'm just getting, <laughs> Sorry, our, our fellow was having trouble opening the door to exit this room, and so I had to step away for a second. Sorry about that. 
Um, so um, anyways, we, uh, we use these nine French scopes and this 16 and a half French scope are the traditional scopes that we use. Um, the, uh, the 16 and a half, again, we use for biliary casts mostly and the 9.5 French scopes you can use for uh, stones. Um, the rigid endoscope we typically use for gallstones. Uh, those are placed through a 24 French, uh, it's actually not metallic, it's a Teflon sheet that we use. Um, those are either made by Bard X Force or the Boston Scientific uh, makes one as well. The Nephromax sheet, uh, both can be easily used for for rigid endoscopy. Um, it allows you to use these ultrasonic lithotripsy probes, which are the same probes that the urologists use to treat large staghorn calculi. So those uh, are tremendously helpful to treat large gallstones. When we're talking about using treating small gallstones, that basket that uh, Jeff showed uh, the um, uh, the uh, night and all baskets are typically red handle graspers, which he alluded to earlier. Um, those are actually really good. Uh, it's called the N circle is specifically the model of that. Uh, and it allows you to grab stones relatively easily uh, through the rigid endoscope. But for the large gallstones, the ultrasonic lithotripter is enormously helpful. This is what normal bile ducts look like. This is what we love to see because these are pristine. You can literally navigate uh, these uh, bile ducts so easily with the endoscopes that you can even get into these sub-segmental ducts. So you see us in this uh, segmental duct, but we can actually go into these sub-segmental ducts and actually look inside of those. And it's, it's really remarkable to see uh, the entire biliary tree from an endoscopic view. Um, and something you can really probably only experience by doing uh, percutaneous endoscopy, even with spyglass and retrograde techniques uh, coming by ERCP, you don't get such beautiful high quality images as what you see when you do it percutaneously with these larger scopes. Um, so uh, typically we talked about this earlier, or Jeff talked about this earlier, we place a, upsize the tubes. To The traditional way to do it is to upsize to 14 French, and you usually want to be roughly two to four French larger than the size of your scope. In order to um, in order to perform endoscopy, so if you're using a nine and a half French scope, you can use usually a 12 French peel away sheath, uh, just so that you have a little bit of fluid egress around your scope, so you don't distend the system tremendously. So that's enormously helpful to do as well. So to make sure that you have roughly two to four French larger than the size of your scope. With the um, with the rigid scopes, we typically just go up about a French and a half. The 24 French is typically sufficient for the 22 and a half French scope, so that's okay. Um, so again, you can use all different types of access sites. You can read this slide um, for all the different routes you can go in. This is that bar X force that we talked about, and Jeff showed this as well for dilating the tract um, and performing endoscopy as well. So the one important thing with regards to cholecystoscopy specifically is always carefully scrutinize your access because sometimes when you get an outside placed cholecystoscopy tube it may not be the ideal access point in order to enter the gallbladder uh, and be able to take out as many stones as possible sometimes you need to get a new access into the fundus of the gallbladder and such as in this case uh, where this patient had had more of an antral access and we had to repeat the access and get a fundal access in order to uh, dilate the tract and subsequently perform cholecystoscopy um, so really scrutinize your access because this access would not be ideal for a rigid endoscope because if you can imagine if you stick a rigid endoscope here you're pretty much limited to treating only the antrum of the gallbladder and you're going to miss the whole fundus unless you use a flexible endoscope which can again be cumbersome and what makes these procedures a lot faster is to, to use the rigid endoscope where you can treat these large stones uh, from just a single access point and uh, see the entirety of the gallbladder. So next slide here. So here's stone extraction. We talked about some of the techniques earlier. Uh, Jeff alluded to electrohydraulic lithotripters as well as ultrasonic lithotripters, which are options. Is my audio still working? Can you guys no, your hear slides, me? The, your slides aren't it. Yeah, it's working. Hello? So we're still on your access cholecystoscopy page. Yeah, your slides aren't advancing, Robbie. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear us? There it goes. Are you there, Ravi? Dr. Srinivasa, can you hear us?
So I think you'll need to reconnect in this case. Let me just send him a quick okay. chat. I'll just text him. All right. If, if there are any questions, are there any other questions? Because I can. Yeah, it looks like we had one just come in. Um, how often or rare is it to see a fistula between the gallbladder and skin following these procedures? Uh, so in general, there's no direct fistula to be honest, because so your access would be directly, you would place a needle into the gallbladder, then you would uh, use your scope to evaluate the gallbladder and to remove your stones. Then afterwards, you, you would hear me and hello. Hey. Yeah, oh, sorry. I somehow got disconnected, and I don't know what happened there. Yeah. The, you guys the answer, now? I, yeah, yeah. I was just answering one question for them, Robbie. Uh, okay. Essentially, essentially, the answer is you'd never really see a fistula because uh, you'd have a tube in there, like a cholecystostomy tube, after the after removing the gallstones. And then after four to six weeks, you remove that tube and it just closes on its own like any normal cholecystostomy tract would close. So you don't really develop a persistent fistula. It just closes with time. Yeah. Exactly. All right, Robbie. So, uh, so we talked about uh, earlier the different techniques for uh, doing uh, stone fragmentation. Those include e EHL, which is the electrohydraulic lipocryptor. And then the UHL, which again, you can use through the larger scopes, through the 22 and a half French scopes. The EHL, you can use through pretty much any scope, even as small as the nine and a half or 7.95 French scope. So in general, the things to remember are the 7.95 and the nine and a half French scopes have 3.6 French working channels. And the 16 and a half French scope has a 5.5 French working channel. And then your 22 and a half French scope has a four millimeter working channel. So you can pretty much put anything through the four, uh, to the, to the rigid endoscope. Um, so sphincteroplasty is typically done in some of these cases as well. If they haven't already had a, a, a traditional sphincterotomy, we could do it with a cutting balloon. So we usually use an eight millimeter cutting balloon, which is the largest cutting balloons we have. Um, and so that's what we use in order to uh, do a sphincterotomy so that we can push some of the larger stones out uh, after you've fragmented them. So again, your goal with cholecystoscopy in the gallbladder is to actually remove every single stone and then sweep the cystic duct to make sure it's clear. In choledocoscopy, where you're doing the bile ducts, your goal is to really just fragment the stone and make it small enough that you can push it through the sphincter and just push it into the bowel because then it'll just get uh, passed in the GI tract. So um, those tend to be a little bit shorter cases when you're talking about just a single like two centimeter stone that's in the common bile duct that they couldn't get to by ERCP, fragment it with the holmium laser, and then you just push it out and you're done. Um, so those tend to be quick cases. So again, you do balloon sweeping, and so this is a good segue to that. I don't know if this video will actually work uh, or you guys can see it at all, but uh, this is just an example of pushing uh, stones out using a occlusion balloon. So we just use a standard Boston Scientific Occlusion Balloon in order to push the stones out into the bowel. Um, so these are the baskets that we use. So these are a little bit uh, less uh, irritating to the bile duct than the Wittich basket, which is made out of steel. You have these night and all stone baskets that are made by Boston, uh, which are the zero tip baskets. And we find these to be tra tra uh, traditionally very helpful. Um, so they come in 1.9 French as well as three French sizes. Um, so the three French is a little more robust, and so you can use that through the larger endoscopes. You can also use it through the smaller endoscope, but your visualization gets tremendously worse uh, when you're using it through the smaller scopes. Because again, if you remember, the smaller scopes have a 3.6 French working channel, and the same working channel, the, the working channel is the same channel where the saline goes through. So you can imagine you only have 0.6 French of room for saline to go through, so your visualization is, is somewhat hindered. But when you use the 16 and a half French scope, which has the 5.5 French working channel, you preserve your visualization with the larger baskets, the three French baskets. So I don't know if this video is playing again, but um, the uh, this is grasping a stone, and you can see it grasped using this zero tip basket. So uh, and here's using forceps in the uh, uh, gallbladder to remove some stones as well. And so you could use those. We've used these rock nets as well to pick up fragments as well. These you can get from your endoscopy uh, uh, colleagues uh, in order to see if you can use this. This tends to be a little bit more uh, fragile and these nets can potentially
potentially break. So you got to be careful and be gentle with it when you're trying to remove uh, stones with them. Um, so the EHL we talked about before, this is kind of becoming more of a historical thing because laser works so much better than, than EHL. So um, I strongly recommend that you get laser privileges and use the Holmium laser because it, it makes, it's a night and day difference with, in terms of fragmenting stones. So I'll, I'll show these couple of slides, but um, we'll kind of move on to just talking about uh, other techniques as well. So the most important things with when you're using EHL or the Holmium laser that you're not touching the wall of the bile duct or the wall of the gallbladder because you don't want to burn the wall. Um, uh, you could cause definitely bleeding uh, if that happens and you can potentially perforate the, the bile duct or the gallbladder. So you definitely don't want to do that. We typically use the uh, the 1.9 or the 3 French electrohydraulic lithotripsy probes if we do use them. Um, they do not work well through the, through the uh, disposable scopes, I will tell you. And the reason for that is they cause some digital interference and the, actually the signal cuts out when you use the uh, EHL through the uh, disposable scopes, and that's because it uses this digital signal as opposed to the analog signal that the uh, the uh, reusable scopes use. So um, that's an important point to note, is that if you're going to use uh, fragmenting devices through the disposable scope when you're starting your practice, you'll need to get the Holmium laser or you'll need to just use baskets or use other techniques to fragment the stones. Uh, but uh, ideally, you would want to get the laser. So. Here's an example. I don't know if this video is playing again, but to this is showing fragmentation of stones using the EHL. Here's the ultrasonic lithotripter, which is a large um, device that we use through the rigid scope to fragment stones. And here we're sucking out stone through uh, through the suction tubing that that's get, gets connected to the ultrasonic lithotripter. Um, so again, uh, here's uh, some more images showing us uh, fragmenting a stone within the gallbladder using the ultrasonic lithotripter. And here's that 272 micron laser fiber I was talking about, which actually is enormously helpful in terms of fragmenting stones. I don't know if this video is playing, but uh, it's playing on my screen. Uh, but it's showing basically uh, a laser fragmenting stones. And you can set this to settings that allow you to really make dust out of stone. So you can set it to a really high pulse frequency uh, and, uh, and, and really make quick work of large stones and even small stones can turn into dust essentially. Um, the folks at Hopkins are using these large powered stone, uh, lasers, uh, which actually have to plug into 220 volt, 240 volt outlets, um, which require the big dryer size outlets, but uh, they, they work really well to, to make mincemeat out of these stones. Um, so again, post-intervention, we usually with the gallbladder cases, we typically place a 14 French drain in the gallbladder and a 10 French transcystic drain down into the bowel across the cystic duct. And that's mostly to sweep the cystic duct. Not everyone does that. And it's probably not absolutely necessary. You just need to really leave a tube in the gallbladder. But the reason we put both is because we do the larger size hole with the 24 French, ideally uh, through the same hole. Um, we are now then putting a 10 and a 14 French drain. So it adds up to 24 that way. Um, usually they re return for tube downsizing and subsequent removal after that. Um, so we recently published in AJR our uh, experience with cholecystoscopy at 13 patients. Um, the most of them had transhepatic accesses, only a couple had transperitoneal accesses, and 13 of them in, in total underwent actually cholecystoscopy. Um, and uh, the, our primary success rate was actually 11 out of 13. Um, so 85% of patients had just a single procedure with complete removal of their stones. There was one patient, or actually two patients, who had to have come back for additional procedures, just given, given the amount of calculi they had. So we've just brought them back for a second procedure, and all of them had their tubes subsequently removed. Uh, the mean time from cholecystoscopy to removal was 39 days, and uh, all patients had their cholecystostomy tubes removed. Only one patient in our series of 13 patients had uh, had recurrent cholecystitis, and that was uh, quite a while later, 10, 1,000 days after their cholecystoscopy procedure. So this is a really, really effective procedure for getting tubes out in patients who have chronic indwelling cholecystostomy tubes and who have stone disease that's causing their acute cholecystitis. And we can be tremendously helpful in these cases who are not uh, surgical candidates. So again, biliary endoscopy is a new frontier for IR. Um, if you let surgeons and TI specialists know it's available, you'll get plenty of referrals. The results are awesome. Uh, the, uh, the main thing is to think about it in a collaborative way. You're not trying to steal cases. And that's the way you need to present it to the GI folks and the surgeons is that this is not an effort to steal work from them. 
it's just a, a way to help them uh, take better care of their patients and help them in quandaries where they have difficulty treating the patient or they were unsuccessful the first time where we can come in and potentially be very successful. Um, so I'll show a couple of quick cases. This was a 23-year-old woman uh, who had uh, hepatico jejunostomy and presented with cholangitis. Um, you can see on MRCP these multiple filling defects within the biliary tree. And on uh, PTC, you can see these extensive filling defects in the left-sided bile ducts. Again, coming from a contralateral approach, I didn't really mention this before, but uh, coming from a right-sided approach here sometimes can be tremendously helpful when you have stones extending all the way down, uh, all the way up into the biliary tree, because you can actually cross over and go extensively throughout the entire bile duct, fragment the stones and sweep them down and pull them down. Uh, but uh, as opposed to getting a direct access into the left duct, which is also an option, but sometimes the contralateral approach is really effective as well. So uh, in the subsequent image here, you can see it's coming across with the endoscope and clearing the biliary tree, and subsequently the patient was stone-free and had their tube removed. Uh, this is another patient with cholecystitis, uh, had uh, multiple comorbidities, including obesity, cirrhosis, agenesis of the right hepatic lobe, and metastatic testicular cancer, who presented with acute cholecystitis. You can see this extensive uh, filling defects within the gallbladder and MR, as well as on cholecyst uh, cholecystography, um, which shows extensive stones and, and uh, gallbladder sludge. Um, and so in this patient, we cleared the stones with cholecystoscopy, and then we uh, embolized the cystic duct and essentially alcohol ablated the gallbladder. So it's not absolutely necessary. We did this early on. We were doing this, and uh, Jeff and I were just talking about this before we started this uh, webinar about alcohol ablation of the gallbladder, which is certainly another option. The UCSF group has published uh, at least an animal an animal model of doing cryoablation of the gallbladder to treat cholecystitis as well. Um, so there's a lot of approaches you can consider um, doing cholecystoscopy, clearing the stones, uh, and uh, sweeping the cystic duct is also in itself effective in terms of getting patients to free, as you saw in that AJR paper that we published. Um, so this is what uh, stones look like when you remove these hundreds of stones from the gallbladder, as you can see in these two pictures. Um, I'll show you one, a couple more cases or maybe one more case. Uh, this is a 46-year-old woman who had ortho, an orthotopic liver transplant and had uh, elevated LFT. So this is that example that I was telling you about where patients who get hepatic artery stenosis or hepatic artery narrowing after a liver transplant end up getting biliary necrosis and getting these casts within the biliary tree. These are tremendously difficult to, to remove uh, from a retrograde approach, but are relatively easier to remove from a bilateral percutaneous transhepatic approach where you do endoscopy and essentially remove these casts. Um, so here you can see us getting access into the biliary tree, and then uh, we did colodocoscopy and cleared all of the casts, and you can see how much better the flow is to this biliary system following the removal of the of the cast. So here are these casts which have this T-shape within the biliary tree, which this is the case of Dr. DeSica's, um, where he removed a uh, cast from the biliary tree. So again, in summary, uh, colodocoscopy is a really valuable technique. There's a variety of different uses. You can do foreign bodies. You can do biopsies under direct visualization. You can weak analyze obstructions. So I can't tell you how many times we've had a, a really pinhole tight stricture where we've struggled by doing it uh, percutaneously. This, this doesn't happen that often. Usually you can bring the patient back after letting them decompress and get through an obstructed biliary tree, but there's some instances where that doesn't work and, and getting in, it, it's a lot easier by having a colodocoscope and being able to see the pinhole and put a wire through it uh, directly. It also saves you a lot of fluoro time. Um, and that's the other thing that should be reiterated about this is when you're doing endoscopy, you're not radiating yourself or the patient. Um, so your radiation doses will go down as well when you use endoscopes. And that's why these uses, as, as Jeff was alluding to earlier, uh, for using it in the genitor urinary system, the GI tract, et cetera, there's so many places where this can be uh, applied uh, and it'll reduce your radiation doses as well. And that's a really important thing to note as well. Um, again, these are some of the most amazing and fun cases that we do. And I strongly urge all of you guys to think about bringing this to your practices. Um, we're happy to help in any way to, to, to help you guys facilitate those things. We've published all these things, including this video tutorial, which Jeff also talked about um, uh, on JVIR. So if you want to see actually how one of these procedures goes start to finish, uh, please check out this video on JVIR. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, again, feel free to email me or Jeff, and we're happy to uh, answer any of your questions now or in the future. Thanks again for awesome. everyone's attention.
Awesome, Dr. Srinivasa. That was great. I really liked seeing those videos along with your explanations. Um, we do have a couple questions for you if you have a minute. Sure. Uh, the first one is actually a bit more practice oriented. So if you were going to introduce this to a practice, would you start with cholecystoscopy? And what do you think is the best bang for your buck in terms of having clinical success and opening a good referral line with GI and surgery? Yeah, it's a great question. And that's actually one of the questions my brother was just asking me as well today, just uh, coincidentally. So I think the best thing to start with would be to be biliary stuff as opposed to gallbladder. Gallbladder, you're going to find to be really somewhat cumbersome through a flexible endoscope because, again, the, the endoscope you're going to have the easiest access to is to probably get these uh, flexible endoscopes. And whether it be borrowing a flex flexible reusable endoscope from the OR or from the GI department or getting this disposable endoscope, the, the Boston Scientific Lip of You, which is really easy to get because you just have to call the Boston rep uh, for urology and, and get the get the device. Uh, and there's just a few little additional things you'll need, some tubing and some saline bags, et cetera. But those are really easy to tell you how to set those things up. Um, it's a lot easier to do biliary cases with that with those flexible scopes than it is to do gallbladder cases. Some people might argue otherwise and that you can do gallbladder cases uh, through flexible endoscopes, and you can. Um, it, it's just a little bit more tedious and probably takes a little bit more experience doing those types of cases. And you certainly could remove, you know, a few stones or maybe a handful of stones uh, from the gallbladder using a flexible endoscope. But when you get to these cases where there's 50 or 100 stones within the gallbladder, you're going to be wanting to pull your eyes out trying to remove those through a flexible endoscope. It's just so much easier through a rigid endoscope to remove hundreds of stones from the gallbladder. Um, so I would say the biliary cases, the ones where they've had a duodenal diverticulum, uh, where they've failed or they uh, have had a ruin Y gastric bypass, I think those are the cases where they're going to potentially reach out to you to to see. I know some of the GI endoscopists are doing these transhepatic techniques and transgastric into the liver and poking in percutaneously and scoping that way. So if you have aggressive endoscopists like that, it may be a little bit more uh, difficult to, to get a practice started. But I think when you uh, offer to do it in the cases where they'd have to do a double balloon enteroscopy as an alternative option, or if the patient already is getting a PTC for whatever reason, they got referred for a PTC and they have a stone, or, or some debris or something within the biliary tree that looks abnormal, uh, I think that would be the best place to get your patients. The way we get a lot of the patients too is just because we do these check changes on, on patients for uh, indwelling biliary tubes or cholecystostomy tubes, and we see that they have a stone in their biliary tree or they see they have a mass or some filling defect, and we just offer the referring service uh, an option to be able to do endoscopy and, and evaluate it further and decide whether we can treat it percutaneously as well with endoscopic means. Um, so I think that's another way that you can get your referrals in addition to reaching out to the GI and surgery folks, maybe giving some talks or showing them some of these papers. Um, also, uh, just looking at your own tube check changes and seeing if you can find patients that way. and Then you have a little bit more control of the patients. And that's how, you know, that's how you build your practice. And then I think we had uh, skipped a question earlier. Um, there's a viewer that uh, wrote this. Uh, he said, this is very fascinating. Just a curious thought, how do GI and urology respond to uh, we using this piece of technology essentially performing many procedures that they have traditionally been doing? How receptive are they? I think overall they've been very receptive. Uh, all our GI folks here have been uh, extraordinarily impressed with the kinds of cases that we've been able to do. Our urology colleagues, too, are, are happy to uh, pass on certain types of cases. Uh, again, we don't use this typically. We're not taking the, the urology staghorn calculi or the, the stones in the, in the renal pelvis or the stones in the ureter type cases. We're mostly doing this uh, for in the genitourinary system in cases where having a scope may, may add to your ability to do uh, what would otherwise be a traditional IR procedure. Uh, for example, um, in patients who have uh, post-surgical ureteral anatomy, we had a case where a patient had a pylovesicostomy, which is essentially where they connect uh, a kidney transplant in this patient to the urinary bladder directly. And this communication had stenosed down, and unfortunately, the kidney had dilated as a result. And the patient had a native ureter as well, uh, that had, or not a native ureter, but a transplanted ureter that had been connected to the bladder, but that had been ligated. 
and the patient had a pylovesicostomy, this connection between the renal pelvis to the bladder. And unfortunately, because the kidney was so enormously dilated, uh, despite numerous attempts by multiple different uh, uh, IR physicians to recanalize this pylovesicostomy, even after decompression of the renal collecting system, it was just so distended and so dilated still that no one could find the little pinhole connection between the, uh, the renal pelvis and the bladder. And we put an endoscope in and we were able to actually see that pinhole directly and uh, within a few minutes. And with very little fluoroscopy time, we put an endoscope in, we're able to see the pinhole and then through your working channel of your endoscope, which is essentially dead on with where you're seeing on the screen, you just line it all up like a crosshair. Uh, you can just put a wire right into it and boom, you're done. You take the endoscope out, just like you would exchange over a wire and uh, you put in a catheter and you dilate it up and you eventually put your tube in. So it can make procedures that are traditional IR procedures on the urology end uh, much easier. Uh, there's other ureteral strictures where we found this helpful, that co case that Jeff showed of uh, the coils that had eroded into the renal collecting system by being able to do endoscopic, endo endoscopic visualization as well as uh, arteriography simultaneously. It, it made the case a lot safer uh, especially for that second patient who uh, had a bleed after uh, after having the coil removed. Um, so you, if you think a little bit out of the box, you can start to do some of these creative things. Again, I wouldn't push the envelope, and I know a lot of other people, especially at the SIR workshop, had alluded that you don't really want to start with this urology stuff and start with that kind of stuff. That probably the best place to start is the biliary tree and talking to the GI folks because that's where we can really make a difference and, and be really helpful. Yeah, I think it, as Ravi alluded to, honestly, the truth is a whole host of uh, cases and patients come up just from failures uh, from other approaches. So this is just another approach for all of these uh, interventions. So there's numerous times that GI, the GI folks do procedures. Many times they're successful, but just sometimes they're not based on anatomy, based on just the particular situation. So if you make yourself available and let them know that you can come from a different way, from a transgastric, from a transhepatic, some other approach may be more successful. Uh, often you can be, and then that can lead to many, many referrals. Uh, any more questions? Yes, yeah, so we have a couple more here. Um... Are there common mistakes at centers who are starting IR endoscopy for routine gallstone removal? Yeah, I think the common mistakes would be not having your setup uh, fine-tuned. So I think if you kind of review our PowerPoints, and we're happy to provide advice as well, I think the main things are you don't want to have a complication when you're starting out of practice uh, in endoscopy and doing these endoscopic interventions. So you want to do everything in a relatively safe way that's uh, painless. Uh, and ideally, probably it'd be better if you're going to start your first case to do it under GA so the patient's not screaming and you're doing it for your first time. So you're trying to figure things out and trying to set things up. Um, the uh, the things like doing the orogastric tube to make things safer if you're using a large volume of fluid uh, might not be unreasonable to consider, especially if you're under GA anyway. Uh, making sure you have all your uh, setup and all your equipment available prior to starting the procedure is going to be really important, especially if you're not used to doing uh, endoscopy. So you want to have stone baskets available. You want to have access to a laser in case you need it. Uh, so you want to set, up, set that up ahead of time because it's very hard to get a laser uh, on the fly and just have someone come over with a laser. It's not that easy. You should set that up ahead of time. You want to set up uh, having all these fluid connections and having uh, fluid saline bags, like larger saline bags. We use three liter saline bags uh, available in the room. Um, and uh, just kind of educate your nurses and techs and everyone about what the procedure is and what uh, uh, what's gonna transpire uh, over the course of the procedure. So everyone's kind of on the same page so you don't uh, have a bad experience the first time that's, you know, sets you up for failure in the future and maybe people won't be as receptive to it. So I think it's important to make sure your setup's good ahead of time. I don't know if Jeff has anything to add. No, I, would, I would totally agree with Ravi. I mean, a lot of this is just knowing your equipment and uh, knowing the patient setup. And I think, like you said, uh, reviewing some of these PowerPoints, 
uh, watching the JVIR video, which again goes through each step and showing the setup of everything. It just makes everything a lot more smooth and uh, makes these procedures more successful in general. Great. Okay, we have two quick more questions for you. One, um, how does alcohol ablate the gallbladder mucosa? Does it caustically scar it immediately or just make it less secretory? And does it need follow-up ultrasound? So again, we were talking about this a little bit earlier today too. So we, we have gone away from alcohol ablating the gallbladder lately and with, to just doing cholecystoscopy and, and removing stones and then clearing the cystic duct by sweeping it, by getting a wire transystically and then sweeping the bile duct. But alcohol is an option to consider in other cases, perhaps if you don't have stone disease and the patient uh, has, you know, uh, a calculus cholecystitis and you want to try to get their tube out, you might consider doing uh, uh, alcohol ablation or cryoablation of the gallbladder. Uh, the mechanism is presumed to be sclerosing the wall and, and essentially causing the wall to scar down and shrink and essentially cause the gallbladder to scar and, and no longer have any secretory function. Um, and you also should in that process coil the cystic duct if you ideally can because you don't want alcohol to theoretically go if the cystic duct is patent to theoretically go through the cystic duct down into the uh, into the bile duct and potentially sclerose other structures which you don't want to sclerose uh, using alcohol so that's typically the way we have done them and it's perhaps something to still consider in cases where you have a calculus cholecystitis but I think if you have access to an endoscope, you should try to clear the stones, sweep the cystic duct of any residual debris if needed, uh, then drain the gallbladder and bring the patient back for a check and, and see if the cystic duct is patent then. And if it is, you can potentially downsize and eventually remove their tube uh, within a few weeks. Okay, great. And our last question for you guys, um, for tube check patients, would you approach the referring physicians or just discuss with the patient in consultation and show the referral the results later? Well, I think as uh, Ravi alluded to, I mean, the best way to sort of make a relationship with that referrer is and to get more patients in the future is just to let them know that that this is a possibility for you actually to remove the stones and to help these patients be tube free. Again, it's not stealing business for anyone. A lot of these patients in particular with gallbladder disease, uh, they're such poor surgical candidates. They're elderly patients. They have heart or pulmonary uh, problems that they can't actually undergo a cholecystectomy safely. Uh, so it's uh, difficult for everyone. It's difficult for interventional radiologists. It's difficult for surgeons as well. And it's incredibly uncomfortable for patients. So everyone is relieved when there is some solution. And to be frank, uh, a lot of uh, surgeons are totally unaware uh, that this is even possible to percutaneously remove stones. Uh, one of our colleagues, Jake Bundy, just wrote an editorial in uh, Annals of Surgery just discussing uh, percutaneous options for removal of gallstones because most people don't know. Uh, so I think the best thing to do is talk to the referrers, uh, speak to the patient as well, uh, but it usually never goes over well if you try to go around your referrers and just talk to the patient directly and just do something without uh, talking to others. But I think for the most part, uh, you'll find that people are actually very happy to hear of these options, everyone, and uh, they'll be excited for you to perform them and they'll actually probably send you even more patients. Yeah, I, the only the other thing I'd add is that perhaps as interventionalists, I think in general, we may be a little bit more timid about, you know, stepping on other people's toes. And I mean, we've, we've experienced it ourselves as interventionalists seeing uh, other types of procedures such as, you know, peripheral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, some venous interventions at some institutions getting taken over by other specialties. Um, this is one area where we can kind of cross a little bit of a boundary, but at the same time, we we're, we're also have bring to the table a, a kind of a unique skill set in that we have catheter skills and have wire skills in addition to being able to apply these endoscopic skills as well. So we provide a little bit of a different uh, uh, ability that maybe a GI person who does endoscopy or a surgeon who does endoscopy may not have. And, you know, we have access to the fluoro. And if you ever are in an endoscopy suite, they're always a little bit timid to, to actually use the fluoroscopy as well. But here we have the option to use fluoroscopy and we have the option to use endoscopy. And it kind of complements each other in a sense where you can actually make 
uh, what would be otherwise a super challenging procedure much, much easier by fusing the two. And, you know, and uh, Scott gave, uh, Scott Teratola gave this talk at uh, his daughter talk actually a few years back on uh, being a competitor in, in the field. And, you know, if you provide a consistently good service uh, to your referring clinicians, you'll continue to get patients and you'll uh, grow your practice that way. And so I think it's important that you be collaborative with other specialties, but don't be afraid either to, to kind of show that you have this other unique skill set that, that you can bring to the table that will make, you know, patient care better. Uh, and uh, providing this to, to, to other referring physicians, they'll see that and they'll start to send you more and more patients. And I think that's how we've kind of grown our practice, uh, particularly here at Michigan. And, and I will just say, uh, last thing before we finish here, uh, like we both said, Robbie and I are certainly happy to answer any questions from any of you or anyone else at all times. You can email us. Uh, we also have our innovations lab uh, where we're trying to come up with new techniques to help patients and advance the field in general. So if you're interested in being involved in any of that, uh, you can contact us as well. And uh, thank you for having us today. Awesome. Thank you so much, okay. both Dr. Srinivasa and Dr. Chick. Thank you for your time. These webinars are, you know, inval invaluable for the RFS in terms of really showing the constant innovation and expansion in the IR toolbox. Uh, so thank you guys again for coming out tonight and giving this talk. And I guess unless Justin has any other closing remarks, uh, we'll finish for the night. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jason. And yeah, thank you again, Dr. Chick and Dr. Sunabasa. Um, and for everyone uh, here attending, again, this uh, video is recorded and will be available on YouTube uh, later on. Um, thank you very much for attending. Thanks again.